got your Bibles, we're going to chapter 4 of Acts. Chapter 4 of the book of Acts. Acts is in the New Testament right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the Acts of the Church, the Acts of the Apostles, after Jesus died and rose again and ascended to the right-hand side of God the Father. And also every week we take out our bulletins, and in our bulletins we have note pages that we love you to fill in and follow along with us, fill in the blanks, and put the answers down. And uh, just interact with the scripture in that way. So let's get right to it. Today we're talking about the three signs of a great church. The three signs of a great church. Somebody, some people think that a great church is uh, filled with great personalities. Or a great church is filled with great music or uh, great technology or a great big building. And while those things are good, and I like those things, they aren't ultimately what makes a church great. A church is not defined by its personality or by the impressive nature of the experience that you have when you go there. A great church is defined by what God says is great. And I want to give you those three realities because we're going to find them here in Acts chapter 4 and 5. We're in a series called Be the Church, and I want to be the church Jesus wants us to be. How many are with me? I want to be the church Jesus wants us to be. So let's take a look at the early church and see these three great signs. Okay, uh, stand with me. Acts chapter 4. Here we go. Verse 32, reading right through uh, chapter 5, verse 11. Now these two stories are going to look like polar opposites of each other. One's a very good positive story. One's a very negative dark story. But they actually work together to tell us what a great church is made up of. All right, Acts 4.32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace, somebody say great grace, was upon them all. So just back up in verse 33, it says great power. And then also in verse 33, great grace. And now verse 34, let's continue. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as he had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the disciples, or by the apostles, Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, chapter 5. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge, I'm sorry, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan so filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, was it not yours to keep? And after it was sold... Was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to God, but to man. I mean, you have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And look at this next great. And great fear. Somebody say great fear. Great fear fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear, say great fear again. Came upon, all, came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Well, we're just going to read a little bit further because look what it says. Now many signs and wonders were done regularly by the people, by the hands of the apostles, among the people, by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them. I don't know if I'd join that church either. Come on, two people just died like that. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Wow, that's an amazing story. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that we will be a church filled with great power, great grace, and great fear. 
reverence, and honor for you. In these next few moments, I pray that we will hear what you're want, that we will hear what you say, and we will see what you see, and we will do as you say as a result. Open our hearts. Help us to see Jesus. In his mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a seat. The three signs of a great church, three realities, if you will. Number one, taking notes, write it down. Great grace expressed in tangible ways. The early church was an active church. A church that's not active is not a church. A church is not just supposed to come into a building and meet together in a big room and hear a speech and then walk out the door and do nothing about it. No, the early church was defined by how they lived out the grace of God. And people could see God's grace because God's people started to do things in the power of God's grace for one another. Verse 32 opens up by saying that the full number of those who believed was one. See, so far Luke has been talking in the book of Acts about how many thousands of people have been coming to Christ. In chapter 2, 3,000 people come to Christ. In chapter 4, 2,000 people come to Christ. But chapter 4 ends with, now the full number of believers were how many? One. <laughs> It doesn't matter the size of the church if all we do is divide and hate on each other. The church is supposed to be a place where people come together as one from every tribe and every tongue and every background and every social status and every economic status. The church of Jesus is not a rich church. It's not a white church. It's not a black church. It's not a Hispanic church. It's not an Asian church. It's a God-glorifying church of all people from all walks of life, giving Jesus Christ the preeminence. One heart, one soul, and then they didn't think their stuff was theirs. The Holy Spirit was changing how they, react, how they responded to possessions. They started to share, and this is the qualifier of how that happened. Verse 33 says, great grace. That's great grace at work in the church. When everybody starts to loosen the grip that they have on their possessions. And in verse 34, it says there wasn't a needy person among them because people sold their lands, they sold their houses, they sold what they needed to sell to make sure that no one in the church had any need. Can I just tell you, this is a great church. A church where people are cared for and they love one another genuinely and people don't come to church for themselves, but they come to church because they know what God has done and they wanna do that for other people. There's a great difference between going to church and being the church. Some people just go to church because they think that that's pretty much all God wants them to do. And I'll tell you something, this is why they actually don't end up, end up going to church because that's boring. That's the, that's the idea, that's religion, that's ritual. That's not what God wants. He wants a people who care for one another, who genuinely love one another. That if we see a need in someone's life, we don't blame God for people's needs, no. We say, thank you God for giving me the means to help meet that need. Come on, somebody. Our world loves to blame God for the disasters of life. Our world loves to blame God for hurts and heartaches and people starving. But this is what we are called to do as God's people. See the need and not complain about it, but do something about it because we know God has blessed us. This is the church Jesus has come to give to the world. This is a church that is visible in the grace of God. Two things that the grace of God produces in the church. Great grace, number one, in the church produces genuine friendship and genuine family. One of the great testimonies about our church that I love is that people tell me this all the time. I feel closer to the people here at Waters Church than even my own family. And that's very much what happens because you're now part of God's family. And there is something powerful that happens in your life when you receive the grace of God. Here's what happens. 
God's grace comes into your life to empower you to live in harmony with God and his people more than anybody else. See, there's a saying in our world, blood is thicker than water. That just means that you're going to always side with your family over friends. But there's something that I like to say, the Jesus, that Jesus' blood is thicker than our blood. That we actually start to feel closer and tighter with God's people than anybody else. There's a camaraderie there. There's a friendship there. There's a family there. Hey, back up in your notes for a moment. I, I know you thought I missed it, but I didn't. Here, here I want to give you a definition of what grace is. Grace is God-given ability and desire to do God's will. Grace is God-given ability and desire to do God's will. The grace of God is not a license to go and do what you want. No, the grace of God is the power of God to want what he wants and then do what he wants. Look where it says there in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice that God's grace saves us, but doesn't just save us and leave us it saves us and then it empowers us to walk in the works that God has mapped out for us that's what grace does grace produces an activity in the life of the church it is God's ability and God's desire to do what God wants um, so he creates a family in the early church and can I just tell you some of you are here you need a family you need a real family more than ever before, people are experiencing the heartache of broken families in our world. The divorce rate of our world, the fractured nature of the, Amer the all-American family. When I was growing up, there were two television shows that we watched religiously. I remember Thursday night, it was can't miss TV night. We would watch two great all-American families. They were the Cosbys and the Keatons. How many know what I'm talking about? The Cosby Show and Family Ties. And we used to watch those families. Wow, what a great film. So fun, so loving. And the Cosby Show, you just, what an amazing American family. And now we know what was going on. Like, not good, right? It's kind of a sign of how on the outside the family can look so good, but on the inside there's all kinds of nonsense going on because people's hearts are evil. That's why we need the grace of God to come and save us from that evil so that we live with the grace of God, the love of God, the power of God, and the care of God for one another as God's people. And this is one of the best things that God does. He puts us in his family, and his family is a great family. There's nothing like the family of God. I've been reading online about loneliness, and I always tell you guys this, but it is the number one problem of our age. Loneliness is killing people. People are lonelier than ever before. For all of our technological advancements, for all of our scientific discovery, for all of the ways in which we can entertain ourselves and fill our minds with all kinds of things to give, keep us occupied, at the end of the day, people are lonelier than ever before. I read a New York Times article. I thought this was actually, you know, kind of like a case in point of the reality of the human heart. And what they did was they found out what time of day people were searching for certain things on Google. So what, at what hour were certain words being searched for at higher rates on Google.com? And they found out that at night things were not so good. Things were not so good. Uh, they found out that at 12.30 a.m., the term Tinder peaked. Now, if you don't know what Tinder is, give thanks to God. <laughs> Tinder is a casual dating, casual hookup dating app. And I've heard from some of my single friends, I don't know, <laughs> that is swipe left if you think they're ugly and swipe right if you think they're hot. And so this is what Tinder is. It's an opportunity for you to make a surface judgment on somebody to see, do I want to get with this person? 12.30, that, that term peaked. One hour later, the term pornography peaks. So evidently, they didn't find anybody on Tinder. <laughs> and now they're going to try to fulfill some sexual fantasy with some unknown person to them. 
And then one hour later, I, I kid you not, I couldn't believe this. One hour later, do you know what, what, you know what, do you know what term peaked at 2.30 a.m.? Loneliness. Loneliness. So evidently, can't find anybody on Tinder. Tried to satisfy some urges on pornography. And now, at the end of the day, I'm just plain lonely. And you know what else? This is the sad part. Right underneath loneliness in the term search, search term ranking was suicide. Don't you see? I'm not judging. Here's what I'm saying. This is the corrupted human heart's search for what only God can give us through Jesus. You see, everybody needs someone in their life. We all need friends. We all need family. And if our family lets us down, who's there? Some of you put all your faith in your family, and then your parents got divorced. Some of you put all your faith in your brothers and sisters, and everybody kind of splintered and went off and did their own thing, and now you feel alone. And some of you put your faith in friends, and they let you down. Can I tell you, get plugged into the family of the living God through the church, and I'll tell you, you'll have an eternal family. It won't be pretty all the time, but I'm telling you, the grace of God will be evident over the long time, and you'll see God's goodness expressed in God's people in amazing ways. Loneliness solved. How? Through the body of Christ. I've already told you about my life. My life has been so blessed by the family of God. There's no family like this family. Amen. Number two, grace, great grace in the church produces genuine giving. Okay? Genuine giving. Not religious giving. Do you know what religious giving is? Religious giving is when the bucket comes by a church, you're like, oh, crap I forgot and you're like fiver for Jesus amen the jokes were okay today the you know yeah that's religious giving or religious giving is I know God wants me to give my money so I'll do it no don't, just don't do it God loves a cheerful giver he doesn't want grumpy giving okay he wants cheerful giving why cheerful? Because here's what the book of Acts says they woke up to. No one said that any of the things that he had was his own. L look at how the Holy Spirit changes what you're tight with. See, naturally, people are tight with money and loose with people. The Holy Spirit comes into the church and it changes it flips that scenario. Now you're tight with people and you're loose with money. Can I tell you that the people loosest with money and tightest with people are the happiest people on the planet? They're happy. Uh, the, the enemy comes in and lies at us and tells us that you need more things, you need better things, you need bigger things to be happy. And you go and you'll chase them and you'll get them and you'll still not be happy. What you need is family, what you need is friendship, what you need is company. It is not good that man should be alone. That's the first thing that God said about human beings when he created Adam. He said, man, I like this guy. He's cool, um, he's kind of good looking because I made him. Uh, he's got a six pack because he hasn't eaten crap yet. I mean, he's a good looking dude. But you know what? He's running around with the monkeys and scratching himself all over the place. <laughs> this guy needs a woman and so he gives. <laughs> Adam, a woman, and he says, now get busy and have babies so that you make a family because you need company. And that's the truth for you and for me. We need company. The church is where we get that. True, genuine company. And some of you will never truly experience this at Water Church until you jump into serving or you jump into our small groups. Outside here, we've got our Be the Church booth. Stop by. Plug in. Make a difference in somebody else's life. Start giving your talents, your time, your treasure to the people. Stop being tight with money and loose with people. Start learning how to be tight with people. Tight, I'm tight with you. You're my brother, you're my, you're my sister, you're my, you're my so fellow soldier in the power of the kingdom. And start being loose with your money and share it because God always blesses you back. Three realities of the great church. Number two is great power. Great power to share the gospel. Now, I don't want you to miss this because it says it right there in the, in the passage in chapter 4. Verse 32 in Acts 4 talks about how they had all things in common and they were sharing. And they really loved each other and they were of one heart and one soul. Verse 34 
talks about how they were selling their land and their property and they were giving to the people who were in need. And you could call these the social works of the church, social works of the church. But right smack dab in the middle, right between those two verses about love for one another is a passage about the fact that with great power, verse 33, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And I just want to highlight that because I want us never to forget that the church does not exist just to be a close-knit, tight group of people. The church exists to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a message to share with the world. And the message is not be nice. Mm -mm. The message is not do good. The message is not don't tick off God. The message is 2,000 years ago, God sent his only begotten son, a sinless savior. He put him on a cross for who? For us sinful people. They killed him, they buried him, but three days later, God raised him to life again and gives his hope and gives his grace to the world, to any who should believe in him. They'll never perish, but have everlasting life. That's our message. And I'm gonna tell you, it's amazing how many times churches start with that message and they don't end with it. They start to whittle down the message because, let's be honest, the blood of Jesus can seem offensive. I don't want that. The blood of Jesus can seem kind of outdated. That's not modern thinking. The blood of Jesus can seem like, you know, offensive to some people. Sacrifice and what's with that? And I don't like that idea. I don't like the idea that I'm a sinner and somebody needs to pay for it. No, that's the gospel, friend. It humbles all of us so that none of us have the ability to strut around here like we, are, that, like we are the cat's meow. We are people who are all saved by God's amazing grace and Jesus did what we could not do and died the death we should have died and rose again for us. The message of the church is that Jesus is alive. I want you to write this in your notes. It is common for a church to get so loving they only end up loving each other. And we gotta be careful of that. This is where churches get clicky. And can I tell you, this is why some churches never grow. And I've been through this stage because our church, we started with 20 people 15 years ago. 20 people 15 years ago. Today, about 1,500 people every week through the doors of Waters Church. Isn't that amazing? But we went through those stages because you go from like crossing the 100-person stage. That's the stage. Crossing the 250-person stage. That's a big stage. And that's the stage where people start saying, I don't want to get the church too big. Because then I won't know everybody. I used to have these conversations with people. They said, like, Pastor, don't let the church get too big because then we won't know everybody. And I would tell these people, I'd ask these people, have you met everybody? Like, do you really like everybody in the church? Because I don't. <laughs> Pastor, shame on you. No, 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 let, let me make something clear. I love everybody. But I don't have to like everybody. Amen. Some of you are feeling freed up right now. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad I don't have to like you. No, don't do that. I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just playing. Don't do that. Don't do that. Some husbands and wives jumped on that right away. I saw you. You don't have to like everybody. And the church can't be about us for it no more. The church is not a holy huddle. Where we all gather together and say, oh, I'm so glad we're all the church. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I mean, no. The church must always have open doors to whoever God sends and whoever we can go out there and bring. Jesus said, go out there to the highways, to the byways. I want my house to be filled. Go find the good, the bad, the ugly, the sinful, the scornful, the shamed, the blamed, all the people who nobody wants. Go get them and bring them in because my grace is enough to cover their sins. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. And we got to preach the gospel to the world because the world needs to know that they are welcome somewhere and they're welcome here. And you say, Pastor, I'm worried you say that too much. Some really, really bad people will come in here and start abusing the grace of God. Listen, we tell them about Jesus, and the Holy Spirit starts to work on them. Don't ever fear 
the kind of sinner God sends. Because grace abounds wherever sin abounds. Grace abounds more wherever sin abounds, I'm telling you. Grace can change the hardest, most ardent, atheistic, God-hating person on the planet and turn them around to be a sold-out follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you think the Bible gives us the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul. And he even tells Timothy in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, he says, uh, chapter 1, I think, of 2 Timothy, he says, I was the worst one, Timothy. I hated this movement. I didn't want anything to do with Jesus. I hated the whole idea of somebody dying for my sins or even God becoming a man. And he says, I am the chief example that God's grace can change the hardest heart you can imagine so that anybody who's out there who might look like they can't be reached, you don't have a doubt in your mind. God's power and God's word and God's gospel is enough to change their heart. Amen? And you know what? A church where people are always coming in and starting to join, it's like a young family welcoming children into their lives. Now, I've had three children come into my home. And my wife has given birth to three beautiful kids. We love them. And and they were work. I'm not kidding you. They were work. But they were a joy. It, it brought life to our home. It brought, it, brought, it brought excitement. New life, right? That's why the Bible calls new Christians infants. They're like new babies brought into your home. Do you know that Cheryl and I just welcomed a brand new baby into our home? We, we welcomed a brand new baby into our home. I want to show you our newest child. Can we put it up on the screen? There he is. Yeah. That's Jax. That's Cheryl's dog. A beautiful little puppy, amen. Look at all you, you're all like, aw. I even heard guys say it, aw. <laughs> Some of you remember me. I, I'm the original anti-dog person. Some of you, you remember this? I told you, I gotta watch what I say up here. I told you, I never have a dog. I got kids, they wanted a puppy, what can I do? I've learned something though. I still don't like dogs. <laughs> but I like puppies. In two years, I'm going to give this one away. So let me know if you're interested. I'm going to get a new puppy. <laughs> Puppies are cool. <laughs> but, you know, you know, I was like so, and Cheryl will tell you this, I was so against getting this dog. I was like, oh, I don't want to. I don't like dogs. I love my kids. So if they want one, they get a dog, right? And I, I remember thinking, like, now my life is divided between before puppy, I call it BP, <laughs> and after puppy, AP. <laughs> And I still, and I, I'm like, one week into this, I'm thinking back to the good old BP days. <laughs> I had all kinds of time on my hand. I could do what I want, go where I want. Now I'm outside in my backyard at 11.30 p.m. saying, go pee pee, go pee pee, go pee pee. <laughs> so I can go to bed, go pee pee. <laughs> and you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of hassle. But you know what? He's brought life into our home. He's brought joy. This is why a church has to always be about bringing people in. Because new Christians have such a heart for Jesus. Such a love for the Lord. They want to learn. They want to grow. And it's wonderful to see their hunger. Their hunger inspires us, our, us old Christians, our hunger. It gets us back in the game. Makes us think, oh yeah, Jesus is alive. Look at how he's changing that person's life. You know, there are some churches... They never want to reach out to the worst kinds of people. They, 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 they don't grow, and the reason why they don't grow is because they don't really want to grow. They like their way. And, and here's what I hear some pastors tell me this, and I know I, I, I might be offending some people, but let me just say, some pastors say this, we're not growing numerically, pastor. We're growing spiritually. We're growing deeper, deep in the things of God. And I just like to say, that's a load of bull. That's a load of bull. You, you, you don't grow. You can only grow so deep when it's just you. I'm just telling you. And I think about, like, like that's like an old dog. Like, that's some churches. Some churches look like this dog right here. Let's put this dog up on the screen. That's some churches right there. <laughs> Full of people just like, huh? when you see this picture, I just want to grow deep. <laughs> We're about spiritual maturity. (laughs) 
<laughs> I want some puppies, man. <laughs> Here's what I want you to write down in your notes. There is a level of growth that only happens when you become responsible for someone else. No, seriously, there, like Christians are really interested in growing, but you haven't read how God has designed the human race to grow. God has designed the human race to grow by learning to think less of yourself and more of others. Less about yourself and more of others. Now you think about this. You have a child come into your home, and, and, and let's back up even further. You're single, and it's all about you. And you can do what you want, and you can go where you want, you can be in where you want, you can move where you want. No, no, no. You just make decisions for you. But here's what God has done. He has designed an institution. It's called marriage. And marriage is designed for two people to come together and start learning how to think of other people. Do you know what marriage really is? Marriage is God takes a man and a woman, he puts them in a room, locks the door, and throws away the key. <laughs> so that they can learn how to stop being selfish. And then God says, if that doesn't work, I'm going to send you some kids. <laughs> and so he starts sending kids into their life. And, now, and you know this, like when the kid is born, now you can't just do whatever you want. And some of you hate that, but some of you love that. And some of you all you got to have to admit this, though, that once that kid comes in the world, now you are growing in exponential ways that you never grew before. This is why God made sex so much fun so that we would have kids and get less selfish. That's how you grow. So in the church, if you don't have new babies coming in, and it's all about you guys, this old dog, no, that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is for new people coming on in and great, great power to proclaim the gospel of God's grace. Number three, great regard for God's glory. Great regard for God's glory. So, like I said, Acts chapter four and five, they look like two polar opposites of each other. You got the church loving each other, caring about each other, giving away their stuff for one another. And then you got Ananias and Sapphira. These two names, they're kind of infamous names in the history of the church. Nobody names their children Sapphira, Ananias. They come in with this idea to sell some land and give it just a portion to the church, but they wanted to look like they were giving it all away. And here's what happens, uh, unfortunately, in almost every church. In almost every church, there are some real deal Christians, and in almost every church, there are some pretenders. Case in point, the early church. Now, why did Ananias and Sapphira do this? Well, I, I think we got to tie it to chapter 4, because in chapter 4 it says, Then Joseph, who was also called Barnabas, which means sons of en son of encouragement, sold a field that belonged to him, and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And I see Ananias and Sapphira see Joseph doing this, and he gets recognized. He gets recognized so much that it goes all the way up to the apostles, and they give him a new name. Like, we're going to call you Barnabas, son of a... Because we see such an amazing work of God in your life. And I think what happened was Ananias and Sapphira said, look at the attention he's getting. Look at the glory he's getting. And their hearts went to work, and they conspired together. It says in verse 1, But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, gave only a part of it. And what's the real sin of Ananias and Sapphira? Like, you could say it was greed. And you, were, you would be right. It is Partly greed. You could say it was lying, and you would be right. They lied not to man, Peter says, but to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit lives in the church. But what was their real sin? Because there's something that underlies all of that. Their real sin was they wanted glory for themselves. They wanted to shine in the house of God. They wanted to be celebrated. And Peter says to them, look, you didn't have to sell the land. Like, this is what you have to understand about the early church. As much as they gave away their possessions and stuff, it wasn't enforced. It wasn't like a rule to join this movement. you got to sell everything. No, that's communism. That's not what the early church did. The early church, it was willful giving. 
because of the work of God in their hearts. And Peter says, you didn't even have to sell the land. And even if you did sell the land, you could give whatever you wanted or you could give nothing. It's yours. Freeness. That's the, that's the beauty of God. He doesn't require this of you. It's he wants to see it in you because of the goodness that he has poured into you. And Peter says, all this stuff, this charade, why did you test the spirit of the Lord? You didn't lie to man. You lied to, uh, you lied to God. And they fall down dead. And you know why? Because God was doing a sacred and special work in the early church to bring glory to his name. And when it comes to God's glory... When it comes to God's glory, don't ever use his church to take glory from God. And I see this many times in many churches, and I hope and I pray it's never in this church. I want that position so that I look good. I want to be there because I want to be important. Oh, I want to be on stage. I want to sing because I, I think that I could really be somebody. No, man, it's not about you. It's not about your glory. It's about his glory. we got to watch out for something. It's called Christianity. Not Christianity. Christianity. I want, I want the church to be about me, my wants, my likes, my comfort, my joy. It's not about you, friend. You know, we also have me worship songs and I'm telling our worship team all the time watch out for some of these worship songs coming down the pike some of these worship songs that come out of these churches that produce worship a lot of good ones but some of them are all about me like no we're not going to sing about us we're going to sing about him and we even have like me verses I can do all things through Christ who gave me strength yeah but Paul was saying that while he was sitting in a Philippian jail Suffering for Jesus, that's what he meant. You know? And there's another one, I'll, I'll quote the first part of it. Uh, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. And we think, okay, that's, that's about me. No, 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 you haven't read the last part of the verse. Because look at the verse, it's Ephesians 3.20, it says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly or exceedingly abundantly of all that we can ask or think. According to the power that work within us, to him, what does it say? Say the next two words. To him be glory in where? The church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know what? We're just one generation. We're one generation of the church, and we're here to tell the next generation not about what we did in our generation, but about what God is doing in all generations. The church is for the glory of God. So I want you to write this last line down and then we're done. Regard for God's glory means I understand it's not about me. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is the best way to be part of God's family. Part of God's great church. Imagine a group of people that aren't selfish, that aren't tight with stuff, but are tight with one another. And don't do it so that they're recognized, but so that their God, their creator, is glorified. I'll tell you, that's the recipe for a great church.